go with me this evening to Revelation chapter 14. Over the, the way the past few weeks have gone in Revelation, I wasn't so sure I wanted to come to chapter 14 because I had forgotten what chapter 14 was about until this week when I came back and read it again. And I thought, yay, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. So at first I had intended or expected us to go through the entire chapter, but tonight we're going to stop and just allow ourselves to enjoy just a taste of the beginning of chapter 14. If you'll go with me. Revelation chapter 14, I'm just going to go through the first five verses. Revelation 14, beginning in verse 1, it says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. Mm -mm. We could stop right there and go all night. But that's not the end of it. With him, 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on our foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice or the sound that he hears. I, the voice that I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. Watch closely. Because this is really misunderstood. Watch closely. No one could learn that new song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth was no lie found, for they are blameless. Lord, we thank you tonight that we are celebrating a victory that is sure to come. Tonight you're giving us a preview of that victory. Holy Spirit, work in this place tonight. You are speaking to a people who need victory in their current situation. So we ask you to give us a glimpse of that eternal, perfect victory that you are bringing. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. So let me take you back to earlier in Revelation and catch us up to where we are. So we have seen so far the church has been raptured to heaven. We stand in glory before the presence of the Father, and he holds in his hand a scroll that will finish the work that he started. A scroll that will redeem not only his people, but all of creation. But it is sealed with seven seals. And so we weep, waiting for the one who is worthy to open those seals. And we are presented with the lamb that has been slain. That lamb is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the worthy one that we call King Jesus. And we have seen him now open each of those seven seals. One by one, he opens up the wrath of God against all those that have rejected salvation in the name of Jesus. One by one, we see that God is separating his people from the rest of creation. And step by step, we see them walk into the judgment that we all have deserved. So we've seen the seals open. We have heard the trumpets sound. And by now we have truly seen a vast overview of the tribulation. 
And then it's spoken to the Apostle John, you must testify, you must prophesy, rather. You must prophesy again. And so the Apostle John goes back. And he is shown specifics now. Specifics about the tribulation. And we see specifically the one who has organized all the chaos on the earth, the dragon, Satan, the devil, the accuser of the brethren. We see him cast out of heaven for the last time, and we see him allowed a brief window on the earth to wreak his havoc. We see him give all of his power and authority to one that we are first shown as the beast that rises from the sea, whom we know to be the Antichrist. He is given all the power the dragon can muster, all the authority, and he brings together the kingdom that Satan has been trying to build all these many years. And they follow the Antichrist. They worship the Antichrist. And he brings along beside him the false prophet. And together... The three of them are the unholy trinity. The ones who pour out this chaos and blasphemous filth for three and a half years. By the end of Revelation chapter 13, which we finished last week, we are left asking this question. It's a question that will be asked by the people living on the earth during the time of the Antichrist. They will say, and in our spirits we cry out even now, who can stand against this beast? Because it is spoken of him in Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, that he will even make war against the saints and overcome them. And so tonight we ask this question, has the Antichrist been completely victorious over all God's people? And what happens to the beast and his followers? Now remember now, we are outside of the timeline. We're no longer experiencing tribulation in a chronological order. We are no longer being shown one step at a time what is happening in order, how it all unfolds. We are being shown specific glimpses now to help us understand what is happening all along the way. And it's as if the Lord in all of his infinite wisdom, speaking through the Holy Spirit, writing through the hand of the Apostle John says, the people that are reading this need a break. <laughs> The people that will see this need to understand, look, I know that it's bad and you have just seen the worst guys, the worst beings from all time, but I'm going to give you a glimpse. So tonight you get a preview of victory. And it begins in verse 1, Revelation chapter 14 again. In verse 1, the Apostle John lets us know that this is a different vision, if you will, a different revelation by using these words. Then I looked and behold, when he says that it triggers us to remember that we are seeing something different. We have now gone from the overview to specifics. We've looked at the unholy trinity. We're looking now at a preview of victory. And he says, then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. Man, what a picture. Now, 99.9% .9 of the time when we read the words Mount Zion in Scripture, we are, are taking from it a spiritual Mount Zion, which is heaven, the eternal heaven. But this time, we're not. Which is really confusing, because we've been talking about heaven for a long time by now. Which is also really confusing because if this is the literal physical Mount Zion on the earth, I'll remind you in just a second where that is. Why is Jesus standing on the earth? It's because we are not looking at the time period in the tribulation. We're getting a glimpse of what's happening outside. After. A glimpse of victory. A preview, if you will. 
And so this is the literal Mount Zion. Mount Zion is a reference to the collection of hills. There are seven hills upon which Jerusalem was built. It's the reason that David chose it because of its strategic positioning up on these hills. Remember, David first built a fortress there. And it's called Mount Zion. Upon which later they expand it, it becomes the entire city of Jerusalem, including the Temple Mount and the Palace of the King. This is Mount Zion, where the King of Kings will stand in victory upon the earth. This will be the new Jerusalem. The place where the new Jerusalem will land from heaven. We are literally talking about the place that you could get on a plane and travel to right now and go to the old city of Jerusalem, Mount Zion. And the Apostle John now seems to be standing on the earth. No longer is he in heaven looking at all the things in heaven. He is now standing on the earth and being given a vision of Jesus himself standing on the earth. When last we saw Jesus, he was sitting seating sitting in his throne. I'm so excited I can't even talk right. He was sitting at the right hand of the Father. Now we see him standing victorious on Mount Zion. But he's not alone. With him are 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on his forehead. Now, it's clear probably you already caught the reference. This is the 144,000. It's not some other random 144,000. These are the 144,000 that are spoken of in Revelation chapter 7. Do you remember, hey, we're about to really crank this tribulation thing up, and the angel says, whoa, hold back the winds until we can seal put a seal on the people of God. And he numbers them just so that we know who he's talking about. 12,000 from each tribe from Israel. These literally are Jewish people that will live during the tribulation time period who will be sealed by God. Back in Revelation chapter 7, it wasn't spoken to us what that seal will be. But now we see, seven chapters later, the seal is the name of the Lamb and of the Father, written somehow on our foreheads. We won't know if it will literally be the letters in Hebrew, or if it is a symbolic reference some way. But in Revelation chapter 7, we see them at the beginning of the tribulation. We're really about to let this thing unleash. Wait, seal these guys. We're going to protect them. I'm going to protect them and bring them through. Now we're getting a glimpse of the victory of Christ at the end of tribulation. We stopped to look at the dragon and the beasts, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Now we can't help but pause and see what happens after the fact. Has the beast truly destroyed all of God's people? And he has to pause long enough to say, look, look at the Christ. Standing victoriously on Mount Zion, surrounded by 144,000 that he has protected. God just can't help but prove himself to be victorious by giving victory to his people. Look, here is the worst time period of all creation. The worst three and a half years that will ever be experienced. The end of the tribulation. There will be chaos and murder like never before. These people will not have been able to buy groceries during this time period. The Antichrist is doing everything he can. Remember, the dragon is hunting down the children of the woman. You remember? But the dragon gives up on the child that is protected and goes after the other children of the woman. Do you remember that from Revelation chapter 12? 
God has so completely protected his remnant, these 144,000, that the Antichrist is forced to go after the other believers outside of that group. And so God says, even when you're doing your worst, Satan, I have the power to protect whomever I choose. He proves that he can bring anyone through anything. And he does it by bringing 144,000 pure Jewish believers through the tribulation without them losing their lives. Because if they had been killed by the Antichrist, they would not be standing on Mount Zion. We'd be back in heaven gathered around a throne. Look at all the martyrs. We've already done that. We've already sang that song. This is standing on the earth, the Christ, the Messiah, the King, surrounded by the 144,000 that he would not let the beast get to. This is a glimpse of victory. Unparalleled power to protect. The dragon thinks he's got it all figured out. Man, when he turns me loose, I'm just going to run wild on this earth. And God says, hold up. I'm going to make you pause. And I'm going to seal my people. Okay. Do your worst. But these are my people. Bring whatever you want to. The famine, the pestilence. All the natural disasters call down fire from the heavens. That's what the false prophet was doing last week, remember? But, but these are my people. You don't have the authority over my people. These I have chosen. Now watch, God has separated out, remember? We saw them marching down the street, the Gentile believers that came to faith. They will be martyred. But these 144,000 receive a different kind of victory. They go through the whole shebang, the whole event, until the last day. These will be the ones standing on the ground when Jesus rides from the sky and we follow him down to the battle. Imagine what it will be like for these guys. We have believed all this time. We've suffered all this time. We have followed you all this time. And now, here we are. We know you said seven years and we've been counting the seconds. And the sky parts. And who is that I see on a white horse at the front of the line? Written on him is his name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he comes down from his mouth as like a two-edged sword. And he speaks his victory so completely, so thoroughly that we don't even have time to describe the battle because the enemy is destroyed as fast as he lands on the earth. And he uh, ascends the mountain of Zion to his throne and he is surrounded by the ones that he has redeemed on the earth, the 144,000. Woo! You thought Revelation was getting a tough... He just has to stop and remind us a little bit. He's still victorious. He is still the conqueror. He is still the king. Isaiah speaks of this time in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 23. He says, then the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed. He's talking about the way the sky has grown dark. For the Lord of hosts reigns on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. Remember who is watching the whole event in, in the heavens. The creatures, the elders, all of us gathered in heaven are watching. That's why it says before his elders. Joel chapter 2, I'm going to have to memorize Joel chapter 2 because I've quoted it every service for like a month. Joel chapter 2 verse 32 says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord 
calls. Oh, man, I just love that. There shall be deliverance. And you know what just really must mess with the devil? Because he knows the scripture better than we do. You know that? He knows. Man, all, everything I can muster is not going to be enough. He, he's going to be so angry and filled with wrath and hatred. And that's why he just tears apart the earth and gets at every believer that he can get access to. But there is a remnant that God saves. He can't get to them. He can't touch them. They are literally 144,000 Jewish believers. And written on their forehead is the name of the Lord and his God. I'm looking for exactly how it was phrased because I want to say it correctly. His name and his father's name is how it says it. We will see in next week in the rest of the chapter that those who had the mark of the beast will be led to destruction. They'll be de destroyed. By the end of the book, they're, thro they're all thrown into the lake of fire. The ones with the mark of the beast. By the way, you remember where the mark of the beast is, right? The forehead and the right hand. He can't do anything original, so he marks the same place as close as he can to the way that God did. Because Mark sealed them, uh, the, the Lord sealed them on their forehead with his name. Not the hand, the forehead. It specifically says the forehead. But, so the mark of the beast leads to destruction, but the seal of God leads to salvation. God is proving that he can save by bringing his remnant alive through the tribulation. That was all in verse 1. <laughs> That's not bad for one verse. Look at verse 2 now. And I heard a voice from heaven. So remember, this is why I say, John is standing on the earth observing. In, in the vision, in the revelation, John stands on the earth now observing what's happening. And so he hears a voice from heaven. The word voice there in the Greek, by the way, could also mean sound. And maybe that's an easier way to understand what he's trying to say is to, instead of saying voice, say sound. The sound is like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. So it's loud, roaring. And the sound that I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. So watch. Who is it that is singing this new song first? It's not the 144,000. The song is being sung in heaven so loudly that they hear it on the earth. Watch. So loudly that it's heard on the earth. I believe you're right, Pastor Rick. I think it's us singing. Because our brothers are about to be redeemed, you see. Everyone else has been martyred. Everyone else has been gathered home, but we have 144,000 brothers and sisters who have endured hell all this time. And so we're about to have choir practice. <laughs> brothers, we have to teach you a song that we like to call the song of the redeemed. And it goes something like this. Watch. Don't take my word for it. Let me prove it to you. In Revelation chapter 5, when we first see Jesus take the scroll, he's about to start breaking the seals. And remember, as soon as he takes the scroll, we just go into a praise break. Pause eternity. We just have to worship the lamb for a minute. 
Watch what happens. Revelation chapter 8, begin, or in chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. When Jesus had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Watch this, watch this. Each holding a harp. What's the sound that the Apostle John hears from heaven? The sound of many harps. They're each holding a harp and with golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. And here's what we sing together. And here's the song that we teach our brothers. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you are slain, and by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. That's the song we teach our brothers. Other theologians may disagree. I, I'm with you, Pastor Rick. Woo! <laughs> Worthy. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb. And so there is a roar from heaven. Worthy is the Lamb. And there will rise up a roar from the earth. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. It keeps going. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Back in Revelation chapter 14. Worthy is the Lamb. You, you can just get stuck in that for a minute. That's a worthy place to get stuck right there. Worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 14 again. Verse 4. Now he's going to describe these 144,000 to us. What makes these guys special? What makes them different? Watch. And verse 4 says, It is these, he gives them four distinct descriptions. It is these who have first not defiled themselves with women because they are virgins. He, he is literally talking about people that have not had sex. These are adults. The Greek here can be used of either men or women. So it doesn't necessarily tell us that it's guys or women. Um, it's because the, the beginning of the verse uses a masculine word. The end of the verse where it says virgin is a word that's used for women. So it is celibate men, virgin women, the group. So it can be either. Which means we are talking about a group of adults who decided before the tribulation began to give themselves so completely to God that they would not have sex. It does something. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. The next thing is, it is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. So these are not some random people that were just born with this seal on their head. These are people who chose Jesus as their Savior, Messianic Jews, who were saved by grace through faith, just the same way you were saved. What's that? If the rapture happens today, if the rapture happens soon, this week, next week, whatever, these people have to be alive today. They have to be within the same generation of the Antichrist. So could they be alive today? Yes. So uh, one of the um, commentaries that I was reading made an interesting point. Since we are literally talking about 144,000 Jewish people who will make a commitment to be celibate for the rest of their lives, that's something that can be watched in real time. That's something that, if you're looking for it within Israel, there are, there are Messianic, there are Jews that have this custom sometime. But when 144,000 of them come out, we know that time is growing short. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They are followers of Jesus that have been saved by grace, and they follow Him as He leads. 
And that's the only way that they've survived the tribulation. It, it makes me think of Elijah out by the brook and the ravens are bringing him food. God leads his people wherever it takes. They haven't been able to shop for years. But he's been feeding them somehow. He's kept them alive this whole time. He's, do you remember what it was like? I know that you've read through the Exodus story as they wander around the wilderness. Their clothes don't rot. Their shoes don't wear out. It, it's just they wake up in the morning and there's food on the ground. You remember what I, I, I referred to it Sunday, uh, the time they got tired of manna and they asked for meat. Do you remember? Have you read that before? I passed it Sunday because I didn't want to stop and take too deep of a time. But they asked for meat. God literally brings in quell. Uh, I can't remember now if it's up to the knees or up to the waist. Yeah. It's all over the place. What are you saying, Dana? I can't hear you. They can be all over the world. It doesn't specifically say where they're from. Yes. Yeah, they could be alive right now. They very well could be alive right now. But they would be biologically Jewish people. Yeah. So they follow the lamb wherever he goes. And that's how he's kept them alive. Because they follow him so closely. The third description is, these have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the lamb. It's telling us that these were the first to be saved during the tribulation. The first that enter into the tribulation saved. Does it make sense when I say it that way? The church has been raptured. And so if these guys have faith in Jesus, specifically in Jesus, it has to happen during the tribulation or they would have been raptured too. So they are committed to God because they have made a vow of celibacy. And when the, the rapture happens, they realize it's Jesus and they're saved. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. If they had been saved before the rapture, they would have been raptured. So they have to get saved during the tribulation. Yes. You're exactly right. And that's a good point to make. That's what I'm trying to, it's what I try to articulate when I say that we're not in the timeline anymore. We're actually, Pastor Rick is exactly right. We're seeing all this stuff folded together. So you can't read straight through Revelation and say, okay, this happens and then this and then that. Because it's, it's, at this point, he's trying to give us details about specific beings and events. And it's all time. It's just all mushed up. It must have been Jesus. So uh, whether it's within the moment or within the first few days or within the first time period, they are the first fruits of the tribulation, the first ones from the tribulation that are saved. And it's probably through them. Um, the, the, um, I'm trying to remember the author of the book that you let me borrow, um, David Jeremiah. Is that right? No, um, the David Jeremiah book is the one I'm thinking of. Um, he has written a great book about this, and half of the book is sort of a storyline the where he just puts it together the way it might work out, and the other half is actually a Bible study. The way they, he sees it and explains it sort of makes sense in this context that it will be Jewish people who realize Jesus was the Savior, and it will be Jewish people that now are spreading the gospel to all the other people left behind. So the people that come to faith will come to faith through this 144,000 in some way. The church is gone. These are the only believers in the beginning. These are the only believers on the earth. It's a small amount of people, especially considering. So we're, close, we're somewhere 7.5 billion now. We're getting close to 8 billion people. 
Um, a third of them are going to die pretty early, if I remember correctly. I think it's a third. It could be a fourth. But um, two or three billion people are going to die. That's still, we're still talking about five or six billion people on the earth, and there are only 144,000 who are believing at that point. So the third thing that it said of them is that they have been redeemed for mankind as the first fruits for God and the Lamb. The last thing that's said of them is, in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. It's a statement of their moral purity. They are set apart by, in this time period, you know, imagine the, the church that's left is going to be run by Satan. You just imagine what it's going to be like as they defile the temple and the holy place and all the things that are going on. These will be the ones set apart from society because of how pure they are morally. So that's where I want to stop tonight. We might have pushed ahead and fought to finish the chapter. But instead I want to show you what this means for you today. For just a few minutes. So what we see in this is that God proves his ability to save by bringing his people through impossible situations. Let me say it again. God proves his ability to save by bringing his people through impossible situations. Israel are slaves in Egypt. We are alive and we have food just because our Egyptian masters allow us to be here. But God does something impossible that sets us free. It was impossible to change Pharaoh's mind. And yet, we leave Egypt not just slaves running away, but we leave Egypt with all the wealth of Egypt. They plundered Egypt, you understand. Took all their stuff. They run out into the desert and they get stuck at the Red Sea. Oh man, Pharaoh is mad by now. How are we ever going to... Moses, did you bring us out here to die because there wasn't enough room to bury us in Egypt? But something impossible happens as God settles a cloud that had been leading us in the front now settles behind us. And the army is chasing us down, but they can't see us. They can't find us. They can't get through to us. So we're between the army and the sea. And the only thing keeping us safe for the night is the hand of God. And when we wake up in the morning, God does something impossible again. He is going to take this sea and split it straight in two. And we're going to walk through on dry ground. By the way, just to make sure that we get up and we go across, he removes his hand from behind us and the Egyptian army starts coming behind also. <laughs> He does something impossible to deliver his people just to prove that he's capable of doing it. He lets those three Hebrew boys go into the fire furnace. He could have kept them out. But instead, the king had to watch as a fourth man stood up in the fire. Didn't we throw three guys inside? Why do I see a fourth? And the fourth is like the Son of God. He does impossible things to prove that he can save his people. We will stand in eternity in heaven and we will tell the story. Do you remember how he brought the 144,000 through? They endured seven years of hell as Satan ran wild on the earth. We all watched from heaven as they endured the torment and the torture as they couldn't find food to eat. But our God is a God of victory and he brought them through the tribulation. God does impossible things to prove that he can save his people. So how impossible does your situation look tonight? <laughs> 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 
God does not need circumstances to be in your favor to bring you victory. He doesn't need the governor to agree. He doesn't need the sickness to behave. He doesn't need the election to go your way. He is capable of bringing victory to whomever, whenever he pleases. And he has made you a promise. You have loved me and I've called you according to my purpose. I'm going to work everything in your life for your good. And I'm going to dare Satan to mess with you just so I can prove there's victory. You are already a conqueror in the name of Jesus. Amen. He does impossible things to prove that he can save his people. The Apostle John was writing in 1 John 5 and he says, Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Look, when your situation is impossible, remind the enemy how the story ends. I'm going to watch you go down. When your situation is impossible, remind yourself how the story ends. Oh, because you know who my worst enemy is. It's not Satan. He gets too much credit. It's Casey that's in this head. It's Casey that tears himself down. It's Casey that struggles to believe. I know what God said, but it doesn't feel like God said that today. God does the impossible to prove that he could save his people. Over and over. It's the story of the gospel. I will do an impossible thing to prove that I can save you. So I've, I've put you in a community in the far stretches of the United States that so hates your Jesus and your church so that when I turn this community upside down, they will know it was me. He does impossible things to prove that he can save his people. Amen. I'm going to let a sickness run wild on your nation so that when I bring healing, they will know it was me. I'm going to put you so far back in the corner, your own people are going to struggle with whether even to show up on Sunday morning. But when I begin to work miracles and signs and wonders in your house, they will know it was me. Because he does impossible things to prove that he can save his people. It doesn't have to feel like victory today. This is what Jesus says to the church in Revelation chapter 3. To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And never shall he go out of it. I will write on him the name of my God. In the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven. And my own new name. The psalmist says it this way in Psalm chapter 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry clay. And he set my feet on a rock, making my steps secure. And he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. So that many will see and fear and they will put their trust in the Lord. Here's how he says it in Psalm 118, 5 and 6. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered me, and he set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? This is Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what David writes in Psalm 27. I believe that I will see the goodness of of the Lord in the land of the living. In case you hadn't caught it, I'm preaching to myself tonight. 
This is the decision that we must come to in this place. There are 19 of us in the house tonight. I counted three times. It's not bad, actually, on a Wednesday night for us. It's pretty good. We who are the heart of this church have to commit to ourselves and to our God. I still believe I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I'm not going to let the fact that they're too afraid to come back get me too messed up. Because I get it. I'm not going to let the fact that the world is against us and now they have an excuse to shut us down. I'm not going to let that worry me too much. Because it is true without the enemy being able to assault it or assail against it. It is true that God will do impossible things to prove that he can bring salvation to his people. And guess what, child of God? He will do it for you every time. Can we worship this evening one more time? We're going to worship celebrating victory tonight. We have victory. We have the victory. As they come, I should have given you warning so that you could already be up here. But I got so excited I couldn't, couldn't hold myself together. God is able and willing to bring victory. So don't let your circumstances get you too messed up. Amen and amen. Lord, we are thankful for the victory that you bring. We are thankful that you are the conquering hero. And that by your victory by your stripes, by your blood, you have redeemed a people for yourself. Thank you for letting us be your people in your kingdom with your victory. We praise you tonight, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.